this is Mark Conlin. I don't know if you can all hear me, but um, yeah, I'm very happy to be talking to you this evening about lung cancer. Um, just see if I can get my slide going. And that one. Okay. All right, good. So um, I'm a cardiothoracic surgeon at St. Vincent's, um, and I've got obviously a big interest in uh, lung cancer surgery and so forth. And I guess, although it's a webinar, it's not the same as what we'd normally be doing. Still, if you have any questions along the way, just um, send them through and we can answer them as we go. Um, unfortunately, yeah, one of our colleagues isn't able to attend tonight, so I'm going to be doing the whole lot. So I guess looking at our learning outcomes, essentially we want to identify appropriate investigations to be undertaken for suspected lung cancer. The next thing we want to have a look at is get an idea about interventional bronchoscopy, um, when we're going to use it and what are some of the new developments in lung cancer and bronchoscopy going forward. Then to describe the importance of early referral um, and outline some of the new cancer treatments um, which are beneficial to patient outcomes and I think that's quite exciting in lung cancer surgery and oncological management of lung cancer that's been a field which has been growing of late and is, is really good. And then also just to get an idea of the multidisciplinary team involved in the management of lung cancer. So we'll do it um, in two case studies. Um, so the first one will basically just be looking at some of the appropriate investigations um, when we suspect somebody has lung cancer. Um, and the second one will be the second learning outcome for case study one is to discuss a little bit about the bronchoscopy. All right, so our first um, patient is a 64-year-old female. Um, she is an ex-smoker, but very active. Um, she's on the go, she plays golf regularly. Um, and essentially she presented just with dyspnea on exertion. Um, and she said that she had difficulty in taking a deep breath. Um, and this has been lasting about two to three months. She didn't admit to any particular chest pain as such, um, no angina, she didn't have weight loss or any other constitutional symptoms, uh, no hemoptysis. So obviously this is, um, you know, it's probably something that um, you may be seeing quite a lot, people just presenting with dyspnea and things. And obviously the differential diagnosis is very wide. So being a cardiothoracic surgeon, I guess, I'll uh, put the cardiac and the respiratory things first, but um, I guess you could have had ischemic heart disease, um, valvular heart disease, maybe some of the common respiratory things such as infection, just an exasperation of COPD, perhaps interstitial lung disease, and of course malignancy will come up in the differential, but for this type of patient, it's probably not the first thing that you think of. And obviously there's a whole heap of other things which I haven't included, um, which you'll know much better than me. So she was initially seen by a cardiologist. Um, they did an echo, they did a CT coronary angiogram, and those basically came back normal. But the chest X-ray didn't. The chest X-ray showed um, some changes in the left upper lobe. Um, it wasn't obviously a mass, and um, essentially the patient went on to have a CT scan. And this was reported, um, she was reported as having confident area of consolidation and traction bronchiectasis in the left upper lobe with surrounding ground glass change. And she had no hilo or mediastinal lymphadenopathy, which is obviously very important. And they found that this was sort of a non-specific appearance and included the differential diagnosis of an organizing pneumonia. And they said that um, malignancy couldn't be excluded. So a bronchoscopy was then planned for her. Um, so obviously these are CT scan images. We have a coronal view and you can see that um, there's sort of this hazy ground glass appearance apically. And then the rest, there's some bronchiectasis. You can see some air bronchograms and maybe that's better demonstrated. Um, on the lateral, you can see some air bronchograms. And the ground glass appearance is mostly sort of anterior. So this isn't a typical mass. Um, when you look at it, you don't think straight away, oh, this is, you know, like a typical lung cancer as such, or a typical MET, but there's obviously something going on there. Um, and essentially she underwent a bronchoscopy. So I guess just looking briefly at the role of bronchoscopy in suspected lung cancer, um, generally we would like to have the patient to have had a CT before doing a bronch. And obviously that helps to assess the lesion in detail. We know where to go with the bronchoscopy. We can plan the bronchoscopy a little bit better. 
Um, it may also give information about other occult lesions. So it's possible that the lesion which you initially think is um, very important, there may be something else which is not that obvious on a chest X-ray, which you may also be able to biopsy or another region where you may want to take washings or brushings from at the same time. And probably one of the key things is uh, the lymph node status. So obviously in lung cancer, when it comes to prognosis and management, which we'll go through a little bit later, um, one of the key determinants is what the lymph node status is. So if the patient has mediastinal lymph node involvement, that generally pushes their staging up and we will stage it as a N2 um, sort of designation. And that generally means that the patient um, is not a candidate for surgery because the stage is relatively advanced. So we like to know what's happening with the lymph nodes as soon as possible. And if the patient has had a CT scan um, and we see the lymph nodes are enlarged or suspicious, then obviously at the time of doing the bronchoscopy, we can do an EBUS. Um, and the EBUS will involve obviously um, biopsying these lymph nodes and we'll go through that a bit later in the talk as well. Um, and it'll be nice to know that obviously before. If the lesion is highly suspicious for uh, malignancy or primary lung cancer, um, we may do a PET CT um, before bronchoscopy. And the reasons are pretty similar because if the mediastinal lymph nodes light up and are FDG avid, um, then we would proceed to a FNA or EBUS of that um, at the time of doing the initial bronchoscopy. All right, so when it comes to the bronchoscopy, um, not surprisingly, we get the best yield with central lesions. Obviously, the more peripheral a lesion is, the more difficult it is to get there, um, and the yield goes down. So the overall sensitivity is around about um, 88%, um, and you can see um, as you go down the biopsy of visible lesions, 74%, washings and brushings a little bit less um, sensitive when it comes to gaining a diagnosis. I've just included this, uh, this slide, um, very basically indications for bronchoscopy in this type of patient. I guess um, one would do a bronchoscopy to evaluate potential pneumonia or infiltrate of unclear etiology. And perhaps this patient would fall into that category. It's not obviously a mass, there's some ground glass pacification as well as the bronchiectatic regions. Um, persistent atelectasis, obviously it's good to do a bronch for that. Have a look and see if there's something causing that. Um, hemoptysis, um, evaluation of stridor or suspected airway obstruction is pretty self-explanatory. Um, centrally located masses or nodules, um, as I've alluded to, these lesions are easily approached with a bronchoscopy and give the best results uh, in terms of yielding a diagnosis. And so these patients will um, be ideal for performing bronchoscopy on. Uh, mediastinal lymphadenopathy also. Um, I guess in the old days, um, we used to do a lot of mediastinoscopy, but now with the EBUS techniques, um, it's pretty rare that we do media, surgical mediastinoscopy anymore. And a lot of these mediastinal lymph nodes can be very nicely biopsied via EBUS and core biopsies can be taken. Um, peripheral lung masses or nodules um, are also amenable to bronchoscopy, but it's a bit more tricky. And there are some new therapies and new techniques, should I rather say, um, that can be used to try and um, locate these lesions. One of them is an ultra-thin uh, bronchoscope. They're only about 2.8 millimeters in diameter, which is tiny. Um, and it allows you to obviously get further up um, than the second or third order bronchus, and you can just keep going and get much closer to the periphery and um, isolate these small nodules. Um, there's also obviously a whole lot of new um, techniques and new technology with sort of computer simulations. And um, this includes electromagnetic navigation bronchoscopy and virtual navigation bronchoscopy. And um, they're very exciting things in that um, obviously from the CT scan, you can essentially work out a pathway to get to the small nodule. Um, and this is then transferred to the um, to the person doing the bronchoscopy in a way which is pretty easy and straightforward to follow um, so that you can end up in the right spot. And this technology, I think, will just continue to grow and grow. And obviously, the bronchoscopy will have a, a far greater um, role to play, and particularly with smaller lesions, which previously were really hard to isolate. 
um, using this technology that's just going to get much much easier and much better um, and in many cases it will um, prevent the need for a transthoracic uh, needle aspirate or transthoracic core biopsy which um, currently is done. There's also um, robotic bronchoscopy which is very similar um, except that the actual movement of the bronchoscope is performed by the robot um, which gives very very precise movements um, with the bronchoscope and once again um, it's linked to CT scans so isolating very small lesions um, becomes much easier. Um, this is not mainstream at the moment there's two robots which are available and being used um, not so much in Australia as far as I know but in the states they're being used at the moment and um, once again this is very exciting stuff um, from a diagnostic point of view. Something that um, is very commonly done though of course is the EBUS um, endobronchial ultrasound um, and although it's a bit maybe quite a lot of information to look at um, this is one of the cruxes of lung cancer management and that's to do with the lymph nodes. So I'll just take you through the basic lymph node stations. Obviously it's not important that you know all the lymph node stations but essentially the lymph nodes in lung cancer the stations are divided into N1 lymph nodes and N2 lymph nodes. N1 being the earlier stage and N2 being a more advanced stage. There's also N3 but N3 and N2 are together so you don't have to worry too much about that. The N1 lymph nodes include all the stations 10 and above. So it's 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Those are all N1. And that basically means that the tumor cells would have spread locally into the lung hyla region but not into the mediastinum. So N1 lymph nodes, if they are positive for tumor, we can still offer the patient surgery and we can resect that. N2 lymph nodes are designated station 1 to 9 and they are mediastinal lymph nodes. So this is bad of course because it means that the tumor cells have moved outside of the lung parenchyma, outside of the lung hilum and into the mediastinum and by this we sort of um, the prognosis is obviously much poorer and the idea is that probably those cells have moved systemically and so often these patients would receive or they almost always would receive adjuvant therapy in terms of chemotherapy or something like that in order to manage their disease. So that's a bit of a long way around but um, these maps are just showing which lymph nodes um, EBUS can uh, reach and essentially if you can imagine you're putting a scope down here obviously all of the nodes on either side of the main bronchi are pretty straightforward to get to so those are two, four, the tens are good and the 11s and 12s, so those are the N1 nodes, are obviously also um, easily reachable. Station 7, which is a subcarinal lymph node, um, is also um, attainable via EBUS. The difficult ones are station 5 and 6, so over here you can see station 5, but essentially station 6 is between the aortic arch and the pulmonary artery. And this is a very important station for um, patients with left upper lobe lung cancer because the left upper lobe obviously sits here and that's directly where it drains to. Eight is parasophageal um, and because it's around the esophagus it's not really in direct contact with the trachea and so EBUS is difficult there. Um, okay so that's basically EBUS. And now back to our patient. So our patient underwent bronchoscopy um, unfortunately it didn't really help aiding the diagnosis. We didn't get any tumor cells, um, there wasn't any infection as such that was diagnosed and it was pretty inconclusive. So she went on to get a trans um, thoracic needle aspirate and you can see this is just the scan with the little needle going through. Interesting is that the area which was biopsied was this ground glass region, not so much the bronchiectatic area, more posteriorly. Um, it's not so easy to appreciate here but basically this sharp demarcation is the demarcation between the upper lobe and the lower lobe and so all of this abnormality is completely within the upper lobe, it is not um, progressing across the fissure, there doesn't look like there's any um, involvement of the lower lobe at all which is good from our point of view. From that biopsy, adenocarcinoma was diagnosed. 
Um, and she then went on to have a PET CT for staging. I guess one of the key questions is, you know, how good is PET, PET CT at looking for positive lymph nodes um, in the mediastinum? And it's pretty good, 77% um, sensitivity and 90% specificity. Uh, and we've already mentioned that if you are highly suspicious for primary lung cancer, we normally would like to do the PET CT before EBUS. So you can see on this, um, these scans, basically this is the CT scan, it's not uh, it's lung windows, it's the mediastinal windows, but this is the area that's abnormal. And you can see that there certainly is some uptake, some FTG uptake in this region. And this is the combined picture and it's a little bit blue there. It's not um, massive uptake, but there certainly is uptake in that region. And as I said before, most importantly, there was no mediastinal lymph node uptake. All right, so when it comes to lung cancer, I guess, um, although it's a little bit um, a little bit in, in depth, and um, probably don't need to know, obviously, all of the staging, but I think it's important just to have a, a brief understanding of what the staging of lung cancer means. And obviously, they keep updating um, the lung cancer stage classification. We're at the eighth edition at the moment. Early stage lung cancer is broadly divided into basically up to stage 2B. So these are all the ones you can see on the screen at the moment. And then from 3A up to stage 4 is sort of like a later stage. Um, so the early stages are ones that can be operated on. So these are patients which have we have a curative intent. So obviously we're aiming to cure the patient from their lung cancer. We can do that by offering them surgery, by resecting all of the tumor, um, any lymph nodes that are involved, and they may or may not require adjuvant therapy after that. So I'm not going to go through each stage, it doesn't really matter. Um, but the important message is, is that all of these tumors are within a lobe. Um, sometimes the T3s, you can even get a little satellite lesion within the same lobe, but that's all resectable. Same with chest wall invasion. Um, and is that it is resectable. So it's not going beyond the chest wall or into the diaphragm or any or into the heart. It's all things that can be easily resected. That's the designation for stage 2B. If lymph nodes are involved, you can see N1 basically means these are lymph nodes within the lung. And as I said before, we can take them out. Stage 3A is a bit of a gray one. Some of these um, patients we can operate on. Um, central tumors, central tumors within the apex, um, and also N2 disease. So you can see that some of them are very, can be very early stage, like a T1A. As soon as you have N2 disease, straight away they go to stage three. Um, there are selected patients which we would operate on, even with N2 disease, but in general, these patients would receive um, chemoradiotherapy first and that goes for the stage threes and the stage fours. Okay, so um, for our patient, she has a adenocarcinoma in the left upper lobe of her lung. Um, she's got no mediastinal lymph node involvement um, and she's pretty fit. So, you know, obviously we want to try and cure her from the tumor and essentially our options are um, surgical therapy or radiotherapy. Currently, the recommendation is for surgery for all patients that can tolerate surgery. If they are inoperable, then radiotherapy is obviously a good option for them too. And particularly with the very early stages, less than five centimeters, we can offer them um, stereotactic body, ratio, body radiation therapy, SBRT. And this is a very focused form of um, radiation therapy. And the results are good but not quite as good as surgery at the moment. Obviously, they don't address, it doesn't address the lymph nodes, it's just radiation therapy to that lesion. Um, but nevertheless, if they're not operable, that's what we would do. Right, in terms of her workup, so we've decided she needs to have an operation, we can cure her from this. Um, what are the tests that we need to do? So I guess the first one obviously would be lung function testing. Um, there obviously are guidelines and so forth for determining whether somebody is going to tolerate a lobectomy or pneumonectomy, um, but they vary a little bit um, and there's not a hard and fast rule, I guess, when it comes down to sort of gray areas. 
in general, um, if somebody has an FEV1 of greater than 1.5 liters, um, broad sort of statement, um, they usually will be fine for a lobectomy. What we're looking for also is their predicted post-operative values. So we look at their FEV1 and we look at their diffusion capacity corrected for alveolar ventilation. So we get them to do formal lung functions and these are the two key parameters that we look at. Essentially, if their predicted post-operative FEV1 is greater than 40% of predicted and their diffusion capacity is also greater than 40%, they'll be fine for that section. Um, the way we work out the predicted post-operative value is really um, to have a look at based on the number of segments they have. So generally, everybody has 19 segments and let's say you're taking out um, a middle lobe, then that's in the right middle lobe, there's two segments there, that's minus two. So you just work out a little equation um, and that'll give you essentially the post-operative predicted values. You can also use... Um, perfusion scintigraphy, which is sort of a slightly newer way of looking at it, where they actually work out in the lung what percentage um, the lobe which you're going to be removed is contributing to the perfusion of the lung in total, and you can get a lot more um, accurate answers with that. For patients with, um, say, normal lungs, it probably doesn't add that much, but in patients that have diseased lungs such as COPD or they've got severe bullous disease in the apices of the lungs, of course it makes a massive difference because some patients, if they've got terrible bullous emphysema in the um, upper lobe, by resecting it, you're probably not changing their lung function at all. You, if anything, you're probably helping them. Um, so yeah, those are the different ways that we can work that out. Anyway, essentially, if the um, FEV1 and diffusion capacity is good, we just proceed with surgery. If it's low and very borderline and we're concerned, we may do a VO2 max. Um, and if that's greater than 20 mils per kilogram per minute, that's fine, we'll just carry on with the surgery. Less than 10 is very high risk and often we wouldn't be able to operate on these patients. So that's how we assess their lungs really. Um, other things obviously is a cardiovascular assessment and I normally would send the patient across to their cardiologist um, or get them to see a cardiologist just for a workup just to check that they're happy with everything. In general, that would include a stress echo or a stress maybe, um, just to assess their fitness for surgery. Actual surgery with a lobectomy doesn't really impact the hemodynamics that much. Um, we use single lung ventilation, so it means they're breathing with one lung, but still it doesn't change their pulmonary pressure as much. It doesn't actually put their heart under a lot of stress. Um, you know, their blood pressure is extremely stable. It's not something that has wild fluctuations in blood pressure and blood loss is minimal. So um, yeah, obviously it's important to check out their cardiovascular status, um, but it's not really a procedure that's associated with massive um, hemodynamic stress as such. Uh, we'd also do a frailty assessment, and it's nice to know if they've had previous surgery on the lungs or the heart, because obviously it'll make it technically more challenging if they have. Important coronary bypass surgery, particularly on the left, because the internal mammary artery runs on the inside of the chest wall. So we know that'll be a bit stuck and um, we just need to be aware of that. All right, I've included this um, little algorithm um, more just for completeness sake, rather than to go through it in detail. It's just an algorithm to um, assess the risk um, dependent on the patient's lung function. Um, and really it just goes through the predicted FEV1s, the diffusion capacities. Um, this algorithm includes a stair climb or shuttle walk. So I guess that's something that you can ask them or you could get them to do, you know, if you're unsure, is there something that they could tolerate? Um, if they can do 22 meters of stair climb or more than 400 meters shuttle walk, you know, then they're good to go. All right, so just to bring it all together, okay, for case study one, so our lady with the left upper lobe mass turned out to be adenocarcinoma. What workup do we need to do prior to definitive surgical treatment? We need a chest x-ray, CT with contrast, PET CT. So if the patient initially has just had a PET CT, I would in any case request them to have a dedicated lung CT scan and it's quite important because the, the, the PET CT, the CT component of that is not very high definition, and we always just get axial cuts. 
Um, when we're planning minimally invasive surgical resection, um, we need to be able to see the bronchial tree very carefully as well as the vascular tree in detail. Um, and so a CT scan, just a standard CT chest, um, sort of like lung cancer protocol with contrast, is what we need to carefully identify all the branches because there are some significant uh, anatomical abnormalities uh, which we need to be aware of prior to the taking the surgery. Right, so once you've done the radiological investigations, they need a biopsy. Sometimes we would operate on patients without a biopsy, um, and I'll discuss that a little bit more later on. For lung function test, cardiology assessment, um, and routine bloods are the last um, components of the workup. So our patient, I did a robotic left upper lobectomy for her, um, went very nicely, and um, we took out a whole lot of lymph nodes that we needed to, stations um, 5, 6, 10, 11, um, 8, and 7. Um, yeah, and she did very well post-operatively. Uh, this is her chest x-ray, uh, I think three days after her operation. You can see it looks very nice. Um, the lower lobes expanded fully. The diaphragm is a little bit high, as we'd expect, and the ribs a little bit crowded. Um, but the lung looks beautiful, and there's no... Uh, pleural effusion or, or pneumothorax. So she's gone home, she went home um, a few days ago and we're just waiting for her pathology report uh, to be finalized because we discussed these all at our lung MDT meeting, um, which I'll get on to um, in the next case presentation. All right, I think that's enough um, for the first case. Um, are there any questions? We do have a question here. Um, could you please comment on the effects of cigarette filters on the increase in lung cancer? Uh, I believe that small lung cancer has increased as a result of cigarette filters that break off and are inhaled. Oh. Yeah, that's a good one. I don't actually know the answer to that, to be honest. Um, yeah, if cigarette filters are increasing the risk of lung cancer. I mean, obviously any smoking is bad and you know, I don't think I would encourage or discourage cigarette filters as such. Like, mm, it's better for them not to be smoking at all. And I don't think the difference between a filter or not a filter will be hard to show that that's made a significant impact. But I haven't read anything about it, so I may be completely wrong and maybe it has had a big impact. I'm not sure. Okay. I think that was the only question for the moment. Okay. All right. Um, Okay, if there are no more questions, then uh, let's move on to case study two. Oh, hold on. Sorry, I've got another yeah. one that's just come through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, should I start? Should one start investigation with a CT chest scan as plain chest X-ray may miss early cancer? Yeah, I think it's a very good question. You know, I think um, obviously before getting a CT scan was quite a big deal and difficult to get, and the radiation was significantly more. And today, it's not such a big deal. Um, I think it depends why you're doing this, why you're doing the investigation. I mean, I guess um, if the patient is at very high risk uh, for cancer in terms of their risk factors, maybe they've got a 40, 50 year um, uh, smoking history, um, it's probably not a wrong thing to do. Um, there have been obviously lung cancer screening um, which has been instituted in other countries in the States. We don't have a routine lung cancer screening program in Australia, although we were um, part of a trial which was recently, um, which was have been taking place over the last I think, year or so. Um, and essentially these were people that were at significant risk of developing lung cancer. And those screening trials have been found to be very beneficial. So I guess if you're having somebody who would um, you would consider it to be a high risk for a tumor, then it would be worthwhile going straight to a CT scan because in many parts of the world, there would probably be um, a fall into just a normal lung cancer screening um, cohort in any event. Mm -hmm. So I think, yeah, it would just depend on, on the patient themselves. Um, if you have a, you know, a young person with no risk factors and you just want to check them out because you think they may have severe pneumonia or something like that, then probably a chest x-ray is absolutely adequate. 
Um, but for somebody who has maybe a very severe smoking history, um, at high risk for uh, lung cancer or something that's crossed your mind, then certainly a CT scan is going to show far more than a chest X-ray will. Yeah, I mean, there's no way you're going to find a chest X-ray a little, you know, sometimes even a little one centimeter ground glass opacity will be very, very hard to pick up on a chest X-ray, of course. Um, whereas a CT scan today, is, the definition is is very, very good. Um, of course, the the downside is that um, you may pick up lots of things on the CT scanner, which is not which may not really change the outcome for the patient. There may be incidental findings which, um, you know, may not be causing their symptoms. So I guess that's sort of like the flip side. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of radiation and things, uh, obviously it's more with the CT scan, but um, yeah, I think they're bringing those radiation doses down significantly um, compared to what they were uh, many years ago with the new scanners. So unless the person's getting repeated scans for, you know, or some other um, um, illness or so forth, it's probably reasonable to do a CT in high-risk patients. Great, thank you. No more questions at this stage. Okay. All right, well, um, that's good. So let's move on to um, a case study two. Um, so our learning outcomes describe the importance of early referral and outcome outline new cancer treatments which improve patient outcomes and also just um, we're going to talk a little bit about multidisciplinary team um, which is involved in the management of lung cancer. So we went through the staging before and I briefly broke it up into the early stages and the late stages. And the early stages are basically stage one and two um, and stage three and four obviously the late ones. Um, the outcome, excuse me, the outcomes of the early um, presenters of the patients with early stage lung cancer, they far, far exceed, you know, those of patients with late stage tumors. So obviously, um, we want the patients early, and that's what I was talking about before. Um, I guess we're trying to get uh, lung cancer screening going in Australia. That's something that will be fantastic if we could get there. Um, at the moment, it's not like that. Far and away, um, the majority of patients that I see for lung cancer surgery um, have lesions which have been found incidentally. Um, they may have had a CTCA, you know, that's quite common. They had a little bit of something and that they thought, oh, maybe they've got coronary disease. Um, they may have had a cough or low respiratory tract infection or chest pain is quite common presentation. Um, the chest pain, however, is not related to the tumor. So they'll present with sometimes a musculoskeletal thing or something a little bit atypical. And um, their, their physician will do a CT scan and a little lesion will be found incidentally. And the reason I say it's often not related to these things is because often the, the, the little tumor can be small, it can be two or three centimeters in the middle of the parenchyma. Um, and peripherally located lesions don't cause any symptoms. They unlikely to cause cough. Um, they won't cause any pain because obviously there's no pain receptors within the lung. Only when you get out to the um, parietal pleura do you start to get pain receptors. So, you know, patients can't feel it. Um, cough is a symptom which obviously may be related to a tumor, of course, particularly if there's some bronchiectatic portion of the of the tumor or there's some obstruction of a more central airway. But for those that are peripherally located, it's not that common um, for them to cause cough. And we often see patients with quite large masses with absolutely no symptoms whatsoever. So I guess, you know, from your point of view, it's very, very hard because, you know, you're seeing patients, loads of patients with these very sort of benign type symptoms and probably you know, the vast, vast majority of them obviously don't have lung cancer at all. They just got a cough, they just have a respiratory tract infection and they've just pulled a muscle in their back. Um, yeah, so that, you know, it's not like they have lung cancer. But I guess the point is that um, if in the back of your mind you have a suspicion, as we've just discussed, and they're high risk, it may be worthwhile scanning them because maybe they do, maybe you find something which, you know, otherwise wouldn't have been found until it's too late to treat. So um, a second case uh, presentation is a 71-year-old gentleman, um, very nice guy. Um, he's an ex-smoker, 20-pack year smoking history. 
yeah, and he presented with scapular pain and he had a CT scan performed and in his right upper lobe they found a mass. It was 21, excuse me, by 16 millimeters and there was peripheral speculation. So let's have a look at his scan. So this is obviously an axial cut. Um, it's a non-contrast scan and what you can see is obviously this mass within the right upper lobe. Okay. So if you look on the left side, this is the fissure dividing the upper and the lower lobe on the left side. Um, and on the right side, the fissure will be in a similar type of area, although it's not very clear, but it's, it's going to be quite close there. What we can see that this mass is tethered to the pleura. Um, also the, its appearance, it's not um, a solid round lobulated clearly circumscribed sort of ball. Um, it has very fuzzy edges and speculated sort of like a star type of or a sun type of appearance. Um, I've only included one image because it's not necessary to go through all of them but essentially this lesion was pretty speculated and highly suspicious for lung cancer. This is basically what we're looking for. He went on to have a PET scan um, once again, this is the CT scan and the mediastinal windows and there's the mass. And if you look at the FDG image, all of this is heart, you don't have to worry about that. Obviously these are the ribs, but that little area there is lighting up um, pretty impressively. This is all liver and kidney, but there's the, this is um, a sagittal view and you can see quite clearly the mass lighting up. Um, so he had an SUV max of 2.2, which is, it's not massive, but it's within the range that we would often see with a lung cancer. Also, it's quite a small mass. It's only like two centimeters. So we wouldn't expect a massive SUV max. You know, this would be pretty typical, sort of in the two to three range. Having a look at his uh, workup, he had really good lung function. FEV1 more than 100%, his diffusion capacity was good. Um, his cardiological workup was completely normal and he was essentially a very low risk patient. So the interesting thing with him is that um, he didn't want to have a biopsy. He said no, he didn't think that a biopsy is going to change anything. He still wants to have this lesion out um, and he was very concerned about developing a pneumothorax after biopsy. Um, obviously it's possible to develop a pneumothorax after biopsy and particularly when the needle has to traverse the fissure. So if you need to go through, say the lower lobe, typically the um, apical segment or the superior segment of the lower lobe to get to the upper lobe, um, if you have to go through that fissure, the risk of pneumothorax is much higher, um, which would obviously necessitate a chest strain and he didn't want to do that. Um, we spent a long time discussing this and he understood everything very, very well but he was pretty um, clear that he felt that wasn't what the way he wanted to go. So as with all our patients, we discussed him at our um, multidisciplinary meeting. So our lung, D lung MDT meeting at St. Vincent's is a weekly meeting. Um, it involves all interested parties, so including obviously the surgeons, the pathologists, the radiologists, the respiratory physicians, the medical oncologists, the radiation oncologists, social services and palliative care. Um, yeah, so it's a very good meeting. We've got a good team that sort of comes together and we know each other pretty well by now and um, it's really a worthwhile thing. Um, currently MDTs for lung cancer are the standard of care and um, meetings have obviously demonstrated improved lung cancer outcomes for all patients. So that is current standard of care which you would all be aware of. Um, the way our meeting works obviously is that any member can obviously put forward patients for discussion. Um, generally there will be patients who have been newly diagnosed with a mass, there may be a solitary pulmonary nodule um, which we're unsure whether to observe or whether it's suspicious enough to warrant biopsy or um, surgical resection. The other patients which we see would often be after surgical resection. We discuss them again. So let's say, <clears throat> let's say excuse me, at diagnosis, we you know, we have a look and we say, yep, this patient um, has been diagnosed with a adenocarcinoma and needs to have surgery. Once we've performed the procedure, they'll come back, we review the pathology and the need for further adjuvant therapy. Um, 
Other common patients would be those um, requiring complex medical oncological decisions. Um, yeah, there's so many new trials on, on the go. Um, often physicians would want to discuss the patients where they want to know, is there a new trial available? Is there something else for this particular patient? And we'll talk a little bit about that um, in a few minutes. Um, obviously our lung MDT meeting has detailed database capture, um, which is great and obviously needed. And we perform quarterly review of our uh, MDT meeting with statistics um, presentations and we go through all the outcomes and so forth. So I think, um, yeah, I mean, it's a great forum and you need it if you're gonna be managing lung cancer, it's just like that. So we discussed um, this gentleman um, and essentially the outcome of the discussion was that it was a very highly suspicious lesion. Essentially, we, the radiologist thought it looked like lung cancer. We all thought it looked like lung cancer. And the recommendation was to have it biopsied, which would be sort of the standard um, pathway to be followed. But they felt if you really objected to that, it would be reasonable to proceed with the resection. Um, it's not uncommon for patients to proceed with a resection without a um, histological diagnosis. Um, sometimes the lesions can be very difficult to access, um, either transbronchially or transthoracically. So those lesions which are really close to big vessels, sometimes you find a mass right on one of the large pulmonary artery branches or one of the pulmonary vein branches. Of course, to put a needle in there would be you know, very dangerous. Um, and sometimes they can be just technically difficult to um, to get to patients that are really obese or patients where the mass is sort of hidden behind the scapula. It can be very difficult to get a needle to those areas, particularly if they're peripheral. Um, so there are certain percentage of patients where we have a look at them. We realize that the chances are this is a lung cancer. We need to do a surgery to resect that. We don't have a pathological diagnosis, but um, the benefit is always risk and benefit, and the benefit of them getting a complete clear resection um, is so great that although we don't have a histological diagnosis going into the surgery, um, we discuss it with the patient. And when they're happy to, if they're happy to proceed, we do that. And um, I feel very comfortable with that. It's a good approach um, for certain patients um, because they get one procedure. Um, and, and they go well. Obviously, there would always be a risk that they may get a procedure where the result didn't come back as a early stage non-small cell lung cancer. It may come back as a carcinoid or some other type of um, benign type mass. Um, but I guess that's why we spend a lot of time talking about it and talking through so they understand exactly what the pros and cons of proceeding with this are. Okay, so when it comes to surgery, um, let's think back to our patient. We're going to be doing a right upper lobectomy for him. Um, there's essentially three ways to do lung cancer resection surgery currently. Uh, the first is an open thoracotomy. Obviously, this is how lung cancer surgery started. Um, typically, it will be a posterior lateral thoracotomy. So this um, just demonstrates the incision. Can be between, I guess, from about eight to 10 centimeters up to 30 centimeters, depending on the surgeon and exposure that's necessary. I think, um, you know, this is something which is still being done. I mean, a lot of people still do open thoracotomies, but it's something that's really being moved away from. Um, all the minimally invasive strategies are becoming more and more common and mainstream. Um, yeah, and this is something that it will eventually nobody will be doing thoracotomies in the future yeah, for early stage lung cancer. Um, the next way is uh, VATS. VATS stands for Video Assisted Thoracoscopic Surgery. So basically what this is, is that um, you can see here, you've got a camera with a little camera scope and you make two other ports and through these ports, you can access or introduce other instruments, whether that be um, a special harmonic scalpel, sort of like a diathermy, which can seal little bits of tissue as it cuts, and maybe a forceps. Um, VATS started off with three ports, so there were three incisions in order to triangulate nicely, so basically you have a camera looking straight on, and then your two instruments coming from the side, and you can work and resect the, the region of lung that you're interested in using that technique. 
Um, this sort of like then got a little bit less to two ports, and today we're doing uni port, so just a single incision. Um, I've been doing these single incision lobectomies for the last three years or three or four years or so. Um, yeah, it's a very good technique because you only require one incision. The incision's just big enough to pull the lung out, so unfortunately that sort of like limits the size of the cut. Because obviously when we need to take the lobe of the lung out, um, we need to get it out somehow. And um, we need to have an incision big enough that we can pull it through. Normally the incision typically is about three to four centimeters large and we can work through a single cut and that's great. Um, it's been very, very good for the patients uh, in terms of their post-operative recovery and their analgesia requirements afterwards. Excuse me, also obviously for the, from a cosmetic point of view, um, yeah, they only end up with a little cut about this big and they've had their lobectomy, it's great. Um, the third way in which we do things um, is robotically, and this is a picture of the Da Vinci um, robotic system. Um, essentially what happens is you've got, the, you've got the patient and you have robot arms which are introduced in a standard fashion into the patient, so you just dissect it and put the little ports in the same way as what you would with a traditional VATS approach. Um, and then the surgeon sits at a console and basically has a look through a screen. Um, you look down and there's basically, it looks like a pair of binoculars, you look down, and essentially it gives you a three-dimensional image, which is very different to the VATS, which is just two dimensions because just one camera. So the clarity on the robot is fantastic, um, and obviously it's zoomed in as well. Uh, these are the little hand controls, and you've got foot pedals as well. And with that, you can basically control the camera. Uh, you can control two arms, which would be your dissection instruments. Um, and often we put a, a third arm in to retract. So you can have one arm, hold it to retract, and then work in a certain area. So, you know, there's no doubt that the robot is the thing of the future, and that's where everything's moving. Um, it's a fantastic sort of um, tool, um, which I've been really enjoy working on. It gives you very, very precise movements um, and the three-dimensional um, visualization is, is very good, particularly for difficult cases. It's really, really good. Um, when looking at minimally invasive surgery, whether it's VATS or the robot, um, all the studies have shown equivalent oncological outcomes and I guess that's always the main question. Um, the robot is exceptional at getting lymph node dissections done very, very nicely because you're able to retract nice, very, very well um, and you can get it right close to the structures. I recently had a patient where I did a left upper lobectomy and um, he had a previous internal mammary artery intact. So basically the mammary artery was lying on the inside of the chest and the lung was just completely stuck to that. Um, you know, it's a difficult dissection, it's very, um, you need to be exactly precise, you can't obviously diathermy close to the vessel because it'll go into spasm, which it was in, um, the mammary was patent, so obviously you would have had a heart attack, which you don't want. Um, and the robot was just fantastic for dissecting that through making very, very micro movements and just dissecting that clear plane, it was brilliant. Um, and I think in many ways, probably even better than doing an open thoracotomy because the, the, the image is so big and your movements are so precise. So um, yeah, that's definitely the way things are going. Anyway, look back to our patient. Um, yeah, he had his right upper lobectomy and this is a chest x-ray um, post-operatively. You can see once again, um, the right diaphragm this time is a little bit higher. Um, he just down and maybe shifted across a bit. The ribs are a little bit crowded. And um, there's the fissure for the middle lobe sitting up at the top there, um, and this is all lower lobe. I think just one other thing to mention with the um, minimally invasive things and with the robot as well is that they, they definitely get less chronic pain syndromes. And I guess the, the bad thing with doing open thoracotomies is that you need to put a rib retractor in. So you obviously divide the intercostal space and you put a rib retractor in and open that. And that force on the ribs puts a lot of pressure on the intercostal nerves. And as you all know, you know the, um, the nerves run underneath each of the ribs. And so by that retractor pressing on the ribs, that's where you get a lot of the chronic pain syndromes. When we do um, VATS, we basically, we don't 
open or spread the ribs, we just cut through the muscle and put that little plastic retractor in and it doesn't really um, impact on the ribs itself, we don't spread it. The robot's even better in that we put a port in, but the robot automatically works out where the fulcrum is. So you align it in such a way that there's no radial force on the ribs and the robot sort of just moves with the fulcrum position exactly at the intercostal space, um, which is which is very good and decreases chronic pain post-surgically. All right, so our gentleman, <clears throat> he went home on day five. His pathology was very good. Um, he had a T2A N0 M0 stage 1B, so it was quite a small tumor. There was no lymph node spread anywhere around the lung, or there was no lymph nodes in the mediastinum either. We took uh, lymph nodes from a, a lot of stations, 7, 8, uh, 11, 2, and 4. <clears throat> Total of 11 nodes, which is good, and they all came back negative. So that's fantastic. So he's had a great um, oncological resection. Um, all of the lymph nodes were sampled, which need to be sampled. Um, I didn't write there what he actually, his diagnosis was, but it was an adenocarcinoma, um, non-small cell adenocarcinoma. <clears throat> and his, um, he had a PL1. PL is basically um, if there is any tumor invasion into the pleura. So there's basically PL1 and PL2. Um, PL1 is basically not quite to the to the edge of the pleura, but it's getting sort of into that final layer. And PL2 is basically on the surface of the lung pleura. Um, so PL1 by itself does not um, indicate that he would require adjuvant therapy or radiotherapy. It hasn't broken through. It's certainly not invading the chest wall and it's still a curative resection, which is great. Um, also, his margins were obviously clear. It was miles away from all of our bronchial resection margins. In him, what was very interesting though is that he came back with an um, EGFR positive. So there's a whole lot of uh, markers which are now being tested for. So previously in lung cancer, you know, you did the resection. If the patient was a higher stage, got sort of one broad sort of um, lot of chemotherapy, there wasn't really much individualization, there weren't too many things to check for. Um, but today there's a whole whack of different um, things that we look at, and one of the mutations that we check for is EGFR. And the advantage of that is that they are very responsive um, to tyrosine kinase inhibitors or TKIs. So he was offered treatment with a TKR, which is which is fantastic. This is basically um, just a result from one of the recent studies, um, the Dura study, where they basically looked at TKIs in patients that are otherwise resectable. So these are early stages, stage 1B, stage 2, and stage 3A. So these are patients which would normally resect. And I guess many years ago, we wouldn't give them any adjuvant therapy. We'd be like, you've been resected, it's finished, there's nothing else to add. Um, but these patients showed a very good um, improvement in disease-free disease survival. Um, the study didn't show increased overall survival, but nevertheless, the disease-free survival was significantly better. And so currently, um, these patients are being offered TKIs. I guess um, this is just the, this is the reason that I chose this patient, just more as an example than as a learning thing specifically. But um, essentially, there are so many new um, medical oncological agents that are coming around, it's, it's just exploding. Um, as I said, there's now immunotherapy, you know, there's other targeted therapy drugs, um, and even the, chemotherapy, the chemotherapeutic agents are changing. Um, and this is one of the strengths, obviously, of a lung MDT meeting is that your medical oncologists know what trials are currently open. Um, which trials they are looking, which specific patients they're looking for to enter into trials. And of course, that's great because it doesn't cost the patient anything. These drugs are extremely expensive. The, the TKI for the patient, which I just mentioned, you know, costs about $8,000 a week, which is, you know, it's exorbitant. So um, unless you can afford that, you want to be in a trial. And so the key is that um, you need to have discussion um, in the MDT meetings so you know what trials are open, specific patients can get into those those trials and, and that's fantastic. But this is this stuff is just taking off and it will continue. It's all gene therapy and um, I guess individualized tailored therapy to each tumor. Yeah. 
Um, radiotherapy also has come along in leaps and bounds with the SBRT. Um, I mentioned this briefly earlier. Essentially, um, they have good outcomes, but not quite as good as um, surgery at the moment. Um, I think a lot of it is to do with um, obviously the way the tumor spreads. You know, it spreads slowly through the lymphatic tissue within the lung uh, parenchyma. That's basically why we do lobectomies for patients, um, even if they are quite an early stage. We also would do, obviously, segmentectomies for patients. So a segmentectomy is where you don't take out the whole lobe, but rather a small individual segment within the lobe. Um, these would typically, typically be for tumors less than two centimeters in size uh, with no lymph node involvement. And um, those outcomes are equivalent. So if you do a segmentectomy or you do a lobectomy, patients with the very early stages, the uh, oncological result is the same. Radiation therapy, I think, is good for the very early um, stages, but it's still not as good as surgery because you're not addressing the lymph nodes. And if there is any spread just outside of the margins of that tumor, radiological margins of the tumor, obviously you're not addressing that. So um, that's where the discrepancy comes in. But for non-surgical patients, it's fantastic. Um, and I think this therapy will continue to grow. I thought I'd just put in this, um, a slide um, basically about the outcomes. Um, it's a slightly different way of looking at it, but I guess it gives um, the basic information. So for early stage, stage one, you can see one year survival is good, it's around 90%. Three year survival is you know 77, somewhere around there, and five year survival is just under 70%. So you know, lung cancer, it's a bad disease. So even early stage people, you know, at five years, their survival's it's not 100% anywhere near. It's it's still um, just under the 70% mark. But you can see where things really um, become bad is when you get to the stage three and stage four disease um, um, stages. And this is why early detection is so great. And if we can pick it up early and treat it aggressively, um, hopefully we can keep as many people as possible in the early stages and um, get good outcomes for them. Once you get to the stage threes and fours, you know, yeah, stage four is only 20% at one year, which is obviously not where we want to be. So the unfortunate thing is that the stage threes and fours are the patients that present with symptoms of lung cancer. It's growing into the chest wall. It's a central thing within the bronchus. They're coughing up lots of blood or it's a massive tumor that's um, causing the dyspnea, um, or obviously if there's distal metastatic disease, you know, they're going to present with those things. So we need to try and aim at these early stages so we can, can sort that out. Um, this is just an interesting slide. Um, you know, it's just a, a local slide, I guess, from Cedar sinai And basically what they just had a look at was overall survival um, by time from diagnosis to surgery. So even though we think of um, trying to keep their stage early in terms of months and, you know, um, we would like them to present early and pick them up early. Also, the time it takes from when they've been first diagnosed to the time of surgery, it's also important to keep that as short as possible. And you can see it, the slide may not come up that clearly, but the turquoise line is, is 12 weeks. So it took 12 weeks from diagnosis to surgery and that definitely seems a little bit worse than those that were operated within, you know, four weeks. So the four weeks is the red line. In general, um, when we get presented patients, we like to do them within 10 days or that's sort of like 10 days, two weeks, sort of like the, the longest we like to delay things. And um, that's just to get access to uh, the robot. The robot, So we can, we can do them robotically, which is probably the best for the patients at the moment. Um, but yeah, we want to get these patients sorted out as soon as possible. Um, and it's not, obviously clinically it's important and you know, from the prognosis, but I think it's also just as important from a mental point of view. It's very, very, um, you know, causes a lot of anguish and mental stress to know that you have a tumor somewhere and you just, you know, you, you want to get that treated as soon as possible. And we see that all the time. Um, so I think that's something that we, is very, very important. It's something that we work hard on. All right, so um, 
come to the end a little bit. Um, early detection is the key, I think, when it comes to lung cancer, as I've tried to um, emphasize. Early stages have a much better prognosis than late stages. Um, surgical resection provides the best outcome in these patients, and I think um, that's pretty clear from the literature currently. Um, certainly, more innovative, minimally invasive procedures um, result in better patient outcomes um, in terms of their length of stay in hospital, but more so in terms of um, oncological resection is great, and their long-term recovery and return to work and chronic pain syndromes are far less than with the larger, more invasive um, procedures in terms of open thoracotomies. And I think um, all the new adjuvant therapies, including targeted therapies, have, have certainly improved patient outcomes. And this is something that's just going to continue to grow and grow and grow and grow and, grow and um, become better and better over time. Um, so it's really important that these patients get um, seen at MDT meetings and so forth. In terms of system, systems-based patient outcomes, um, I think the communication processes is something one can look at. Um, early referral for suspicious lung lesions. Sometimes, um, obviously, you may not want to intervene straight away. There will be you know, many, many, many patients with very small nodules, a six or five millimeter little non-specific nodule. Not every nodule needs to have an intervention or go through this whole process, of course. The vast majority of those are just going to be observed um, with sequential CT scans, and that's fine. But at least we know there's something there, keeping an eye on it, and um, following the appropriate guidelines, and um, that patient won't get missed or get lost. Um, so I guess that's one of the systems-based things. Um, multidisciplinary team discussion to improve decision-making for patient outcomes, I think is uh, crucial. Um, and that's something that's also to do with communication. Um, administrative processes, including pathology recording, um, I guess it's pretty self-explanatory. Um, what type of adjuvant therapy patient undergoes and what would be the plan for sort of um, future recurrence is also quite important. So sometimes the patient may get a resection of a very, very early stage tumor um, and there may be certain markers which would be um, targets for um, TKIs maybe or specific immunotherapy but because the stage is so early there may not be any clinical benefit at the at the moment but were that tumor to recur um, in the future then we would know that that tumor is sensitive to certain immunotherapy or whatever, and um, we would then institute that straight away. So of course, those sorts of, um, that sort of detail is quite important for the patient, um, particularly I guess if they move uh, treatment centers or they're getting their oncological therapy in a different place to they're getting their surgery. Um, and then obviously just follow up scans, booking. Generally after patients have had um, resection for lung cancer, they would get follow up six monthly CT scans. Um, for anything two to four years, we normally recommend two years, um, and annually thereafter. So those are all just administrative um, issues. All right, so I guess um, finally, um, just go through our little learning outcome summary again, um, just point by point. So the first one was to identify appropriate investigations to be undertaken for suspected lung cancer. Um, includes PET, PET CT, lung biopsy, lung function, and blood tests. Um, we discussed the role of interventional bronchoscopy. Um, I guess um, we want to improve the sensitivity, and with new technologies, we're able to improve the sensitivity, but also improve um, the range of lesions which we can um, basically attack with a bronchoscope. So newer technologies will allow for a far greater um, scope for using uh, interventional bronchoscopy and biopsy. Uh, des describe the importance of early referral and new cancer treatments. Well, we know that early referral equals better outcomes. I think that's pretty clear. Um, new treatments we've gone over, um, this minimally invasive surgery, robotic surgery, targeted therapy, immunotherapy, 
and uh, chemotherapy and SBRT. Um, and essentially, um, the multidisciplinary team, I guess all of the, um, all of the different disciplines are involved. Um, there are discussions, obvious, and we do MD2 audits as well. All right, so you've, um, we've gone through everything, I think. We've gone through two patients, um, a little bit about lung cancer. Hopefully, I've given you some idea about um, how to work the patients up. Um, which types of patients we see and which patients, I guess, can get the most benefit out of um, all the new therapies which we have, and obviously those are the early stage patients. Um, a little bit about uh, how the patients go through their surgery um, and what we can expect sort of um, in terms of their overall prognosis and outcomes. All right, thank you very much for, um, yeah, for listening. I hope you all still... Uh, or found it enjoyable and found something to to take home and something that you could um, would benefit your practice. Um, are there any questions? Great, thank you. Yeah, so we do have a couple of questions. Um, so should it be a normal CT chest or a high resolution CT chest scan? I think um, for surgical planning, a high resolution CT is better. Um, but it's not actually necessary just for basic diagnostics. The high resolution CT is actually far more valuable for interstitial lung diseases. Um, it's not necessary to have a high resolution CT um, first off to identify a mass and for our basic surgical planning. So I guess okay. the answer is it doesn't need to be high resolution, but obviously it does give us more information. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, do you perform a frozen section on patients who do not have a biopsy before a thoroctomy? Correct. Yeah, that's a good question. So, in order to do a, um, what you're really asking is uh, about a wedge resection. So, if you have a mass, and let's say it's central within the lobe, if you can imagine you have, say, a lobe, and in the middle is your little mass. To do a wedge resection of that is very, very difficult because you basically have to wedge out three quarters of the lung and the area which you have to staple through is very, very thick lung tissue. So inevitably, um, you may end up with more complications by doing a wedge resection than what you would by taking the lobe out. More importantly and more difficult and sort of the, the real tricky thing is to locate that nodule because there's no way to know exactly where the nodule is if you can't see it on the surface of the lung. Um, by doing a wedge, you may also staple through it, which would then basically cause a positive margin. So if you staple through the edge of the, the lung mass and it's a tumor, now instead of having it all encapsulated by the lung, you have tumor cells on the surface, which of course is a disaster. So those are all reasons not to do a wedge resection. If the lung mass, however, is quite peripheral and easily located and small and well circumscribed, then we would do a wedge resection first because we can localize it nicely and we can be sure that we're going to be getting a clear margin and we've located the region of interest. So I think the the answer is um, sometimes we do do a wedge resection and sometimes we don't, but it depends on the anatomical um, position of the mass also a little bit on the suspicion. So, you know, if you have a young person that says a 23-year-old patient, it's quite a, uh, it looks like a carcinoid, so it's quite well circumscribed, and for whatever reason, they, we often don't biopsy the carcinoids because they bleed a lot. Um, you may well proceed with a wedge resection first. Um, technically, um, with the robot, it's pretty good. You can do a wedge or you can do a lobectomy, and they're pretty equivalent. Um, with a VAT, it's a little bit difficult. Um, sometimes the wedge resection can be actually more difficult than doing the lobectomy technically. Um, and so you may require a bigger incision, a less invasive procedure, because you need to actually feel the mass. Um, and so there may not be that much of a benefit in doing that. So yeah, it's a bit of a convoluted answer, but the, the short answer is patients that have an easily wedgeable lesion, we would do a frozen section for. Patients where the lesion is not amenable to a wedge resection safely, then we would go straight to a lobectomy. Mm -hmm. 
Um, with the VAT procedure, is that done under local or general? Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's, a, that's a good question. So um, we do them all under general anaesthetic, um, all intubated with a double lumen tube. Um, it is possible, and people have done these resections um, in patients that are spontaneously breathing, um, so not intubated. It is possible to do lobectomies in patients under conscious sedation as well. Um, but that's a little bit, um, it's a little bit out there in a way. Um, it's pretty safe to put patients under general anaesthetic. The airway is very secure the way that we do it, um, and there's no risk for aspiration, and it makes the surgical field as optimal as possible. Um, so that's why we do it the way we do it, which is pretty standard throughout the world. But there are institutions, particularly in China, um, where I've been to have a look at some of their procedures um, where they do do them in awake patients. The hard thing is that when you're working um, very sort of deep in the lung on the hilum and close to the corona, it's an extremely sensitive um, part you know, of, of the chest. And by instrumenting close to those areas, patients cough. It's, it's very hard to stop someone coughing unless they're anesthetized. Um, and obviously it's not ideal to be dissecting around vessels and so forth if the patient just suddenly has a coughing fit. So that's the, the tricky bit, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, are there any genetic relationships for lung cancer? Yeah, like familial, I guess, is the question. Um, mm. There aren't any purely sort of inherited, you know, um, conditions is, is the right answer. There aren't. But there are certain families that definitely have a higher propensity for developing cancers. And so there's not a true genetic inheritance where you can say, you know, it's a specific gene, this gene is going to give you lung cancer, um, that I'm aware of at all. Um, but we certainly see a familial um, trend. So patients, you know, who have, um, particularly some patients just get lots of tumors, you know, they, they just will have lung cancer, then they have breast cancer, then they've got ovarian cancer, or, you know, it's just crazy. Um, obviously, familiarly, those patients' relatives I guess would be at a higher risk and they are at a higher risk, but there isn't an identifiable gene which would say oh, this is like a lung cancer gene. Mm -hmm. um, how should GPs follow up pulmonary nodules? Mm -hmm. So there's the, the Fleischner guidelines, which um, I'm not going to go through now, but essentially um, depends on the size and the characteristics of the nodules. Um, once they sort of more than seven millimeters, they need to be investigated a bit more aggressively. Um, and certainly more than a centimeter, they need to, um, they would often be biopsied or um, potentially a resection, depending if they can't biopsy them. Um, less than seven millimeters is a little bit more of a watch and wait type of game. But there are the, I guess um, we just follow the Fleischnick guidelines and it goes through all the different, all the different types. Um, but I mean, from your point of view, if you see a little nodule and you don't know what to do with it and you're like, oh, you know, you're welcome just to send a, um, a little note or email to us and we can have a look through the images and we can work it out and see the patient or whatever. Um, yeah, it's, it's not a big deal. So I think, um, like I said before, not every nodule needs, you know, everything. Most of them just need a follow-up CT scan in three months or whatever. But um, yeah, we just follow the guidelines. But if you want us to have a look at it and follow them up. You know, the lung physicians will be very happy and I'll be very happy to see them and follow that up as well. Okay, great. <clears throat> How often does robotic surgery end up with open surgery? Is it suitable only for localized lesions? Yeah. Um, it's very rare, like in the, yeah, in the four years that I've been doing minimally invasive surgery, so robotic and VATs, I haven't had to convert one patient um, touch wood um, so far, so that's good. Um, but I mean, I guess you know, if you look at the rates, it's probably like it depends on the on the institutions. But it'll be probably like one percent, two percent, something like that. Um, yeah, but we haven't had to do that here. But um, the robot is not is suitable for lobectomies, segmentectomies, sleeve resections. Um, yeah, you can basically, you can do a lot of things with that. 
um, we do diaphragm placations, um, wedge resections, so a lot of things can be done with the robot. Um, I think it just depends a little bit on the patient themselves and um, the disadvantage of the robot is that you need to so this and an advantage, we insufflate CO2, so it just makes the space much better. It's great. We do thymectomies with the robot as well, which is real good. Um, but in some instances where you may need, um, where you may not want the CO2, then obviously, you know, it's not good. Um, hmm. Yeah, but in general, you can do just about everything with the robot, yeah. Okay. Um, any role of the MRI scanner and the lineage in treating lung cancer? MRI? Yeah, MRI is not really um, something which you use commonly for lung cancer. Where it's very good is for pancoast tumors, so tumors in the apices of the lungs that are invading into the thoracic inlet. So they will typically be invading into the brachial plexus and around the subclavian artery and vein. Um, and we need to do quite extensive resections in that area then the MRI is great because obviously those soft tissue planes is what we're really interested in. Um, in terms of pure lung cancer, we, there's not really an advantage because it doesn't give you anything above the CT and the PET CT. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes patients can have um, neurogenic tumors, which is not lung cancer, but there also are guest tumors within the chest cavity. Um, and we would do MRIs around the spine because a lot of those neurogenic tumors will be growing very close to the spine and sometimes into the spinal canal. Um, so <clears throat> those neurofibromas, things like that, we would often um, get MRIs for those before we resect them. Yeah. Okay. Um, in a patient with a chronic cough and sputum, why bother with the chest x-ray? Uh, should yeah. you go straight to a low dose <laughs> CT scan to exclude a more sinister pathology? Yeah, I think I think that's I think that's right. Yeah, I mean I think um, you know if they've been chronically ill, this, the cough's not going away. Um, yeah, I would agree with that. You know, there's not that much more information you're going to get from a chest X-ray, and there, particularly if you're suspicious of something else going on, it's not just an acute thing. Um, yeah, they absolutely I'd agree. Go for the CT. And lucky last, so back to the. Um, to the screening, is there any screening um, options for family members diagnosed with lung cancer? There isn't at the moment, yeah, there, there isn't. So um, at the moment there isn't a screening program, like a formal screening program in Australia at all. Um, and so, yeah, I think it would be difficult, like if you had a family member say, you know, somebody was, 30 for argument's sake and their, one of their parents was just diagnosed with lung cancer at 70 and their parents had smoked for 40 plus years. I mean, there's not really going to be an indication to do a CT scan for that 30 year old, like that doesn't make sense. Um, but I mean, it's a little bit different, I guess, if somebody's had, um, you know, maybe both their parents have, um, have had types of cancers, maybe lung cancer or something along those lines, maybe breast cancer, lung cancer. And, you know, the person you're looking at, they're now in their 50s and they've also been smoking for 40 years or so. I mean, that's a little bit different than maybe you could, um, yeah, you could make an argument for just doing a CT scan um, with very little symptoms. But there's no guideline for that at the moment. Um, and there isn't officially, a, well, there isn't a screening program in Australia at the moment. But I think you could have a high index of suspicion um, in those patients. Yeah, there would be many countries where they would be eligible for screening CT. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that was our last question. So thank you very much, Dr. Colin, for taking the time to present tonight.